So this is an Avocent Merge Point Unity 108E or just the MPU 108E. So this is a IP KVM. So if you don't know, KVM stands for Keyboard Video Mouse. So essentially this unit acts as a giant multiplexer. So you can have one keyboard, monitor, and mouse hooked up to this, and then you hook this up to a bunch of different computers and you can switch through them as though you're sitting at them just using one set of interfaces. Further, this is an IP KVM. So this unit is actually running a little web server. So from a browser on another machine in my network, I can hit the IP address of this and then use my web browser to remotely access those aforementioned machines as though I was sitting in front of them. Um, so that makes remote management a lot easier. So Avocent's a pretty interesting company. They were formed in 2000 from a merger of Apex and Cybex, which are really big KVM manufacturers. Over the years, they would acquire more KVM and uh, console server companies, such as Equinox, Crystal Link, and Cyclades. They were further bought by Emerson Electric in 2009, and then spun off into Emerson Network Power and then in 2016, they were sold and rebranded as Vertiv. So you might see a Vertiv branded version of this unit. I, I've seen Dell has ones as well. It seemed pretty popular, but these were definitely pieces of professional uh, gear, if you can tell by the, the rack ears. So they have a lot more features than you're gonna find from a consumer KVM. I was really looking for something like this because I have a couple of machines I wanted to have made remotely available. So one of them is a Windows 98 machine that needs PS2 keyboard and mouse support. So I was looking at something like the Pi KVM, which is great for USB and HDMI stuff, but if you want PS2, you have to build this janky adapter that only sort of works, so it just didn't seem like a viable solution. But this was inexpensive enough, this was under $100, that I thought I'd give this a shot. So if we turn around the back here, first thing you might see, two power connectors. So we have redundant power. There's two jacks for LAN interfaces here, so I can hook this up to two different networks. And then let's talk about this cluster of modem, PDU1, PDU2, setup, and chain ports. So these are all RJ45 ports. So the modem port is interesting. I found that this supports a V34, V90, or V92 compatible modem. I'm gonna guess that's really just for console configuration. So similar to this setup port here, you can log into this via RS-232 and configure it. I, I guess if you don't have physical access to it or you can't get to the, the web browser, you can do config through those ports. So again, these are RJ45 ports. There's a lot of RJ45 ports on this, so they standardized it. I don't believe that this uses like a Cisco rollover style wiring, but you can get these nifty little adapters that have an RJ45 port on one side and a DB25 port on the other. And you can repin these to whatever you need them to be. So this one's for my USR net server, but I think I have like maybe 10 of these or so. And all of the pinouts for these ports are made available in the manual. So using that, I can try to interface it with pretty much anything I want that speaks RS-232. So going back to these PDU ports here, I saw that Vertiv and I guess Avocent also made PDUs that seem to just speak standard VT100 compatible RS-232. So over here, I actually have a couple of other PDUs. So this is an APC, AP9211. You can see the DE9 serial port. There's a 10 base T ethernet management card. eight outlets for power. So I got that at VCF East earlier this year. And then this is an Baytech RPC3 remote power control. So here's the EIA232 port. That's just another name for RS232. This one also has an ethernet port. 
also has eight outlets on the back. So I actually got two of those from my buddy Ethan in Ohio when I went to the Dayton Hamvention. So I have PDUs that speak RS-232, but I'm not sure if this is PDU ports just for Avocent Vertif stuff or if other PDUs are supported. I saw with the Avocent PDUs, it seems like if you interface with one of these, there's some sort of like GUI menu that's maps to RS-232 config, so you don't have to look at a console. But maybe there's some sort of just, you know, console option to get right into these. So it'd be really cool to be able to use them just for console. Um, yeah, but that's definitely something to look at later. So if we look in the middle here, we have an HD15 port and four USB ports. So this will give you your standard VGA to a local display, local keyboard, local mouse, and then there's more ports. I discovered that these will use USB ports if you want any sort of mass storage device. So you could hook up like a flash drive into here and then any machine you remote to, you'll have that flash drive available. So I'm not sure if this is just for USB remote storage or you can put peripherals in there or like, you know, a printer or something. Definitely something to look into. But then these eight ports over here, hence the 108E, these are all RG45 ports that work with different modules. So essentially you get a uh, four pair UTP cable or just a standard ethernet cable. The manual says up to 45 meters, but they also say the same thing for the LAN ports, which is really below ethernet spec. So you could probably go more than 48 meters, but then you interface it with these separate modules here. So this is a DSAVIQ USB 2 module. So it has, I'm going to guess USB 2.0 and a VGA port. Again, we have the RJ45 connection, um, but this one is a, using smaller font, DSAVIQ PS2M. So we have our PS2 connections. Um, there's also USB, probably for remote or um, USB mass storage. VGA, and this just has a little DVI port converter because the Windows 98 thin client I'm using can put out analog VGA. It's just through this port, so you need an adapter. So I have two of those. And then much more interestingly over here, so this is a DSRIQ SRL module. So this does RS-232 serial with a DE9 port and it needs its own power supply. So I actually did buy the official power supply here. So you can see it has like a little squid connector here so you can power four of those serial modules. But this seems like a pretty standard power supply. So center positive, six volts, three amp. So that's 0.75 amp per serial adapter. So you can probably get just your own, you know, adapter to power one off of Amazon for a lot cheaper than it would be for this. This was like a $50 adapter. Mostly bought it just because I didn't know what specs I would need. But yeah, this serial module is probably about 25 bucks, but then these like old USB and PS2 modules, anywhere between five and 15 bucks each. So something cool about this KVM is that it supports a lot of different generations of these modules. So it does DSRIQ, which are the oldest, DZAVIQ, which are sort of the middle ones. I don't know a big difference between the DSRIQ and the DSAVIQ modules, but the, the more recent and expensive ones are the MPUIQ modules, which I don't have any of because they're about $150 each still, as opposed to, you know, five and $15. But those newer modules have versions for DisplayPort and HDMI and actual DVI and stuff like that, which I currently don't need and it's so expensive I probably won't get anytime soon. But even cooler is that this supports different modules for Sun standards. So there's the DSRIQ VSN for VGA Sun equipment and DSRIQ WSN for the 13W3 display connector. I have a couple of those on the way because I do have some Sun hardware I might want to hook up eventually. But yeah, it seems like these 
modules are cheap enough that you can just get a couple of them, even if you don't need them right away, because you never know when you are actually going to end up needing them. Yeah, so this KVM I really settled on in particular, not just because it's an IP-based KVM, but I was reading that with the latest firmware, which I've confirmed, I have it on here, it has been changed from a Java applet when you're doing remote KVM to an HTML5 applet. So in sort of the last swan song for this thing, they added HTML5 support. So that means that I can use any modern browser. I don't have to go looking for some like ancient IE version. It, it pretty much future proofs this for the time being. So the new firmware is Vertiv branded, works totally fine on this Avocent branded unit. They did a really good job making sure that you can get the most bang for your buck out of these things. Yeah, so my next step, I suppose, as I mentioned, I did put the latest firmware on this. I played around with it, but that was about a year ago. I'm going to try to see if I can factory reset it, sort of start fresh and just check things out. But I'm going to hook up the Windows 98 machine, my PBX machine, which is really just uh, Debian CLI anyway, so it's not going to be too crazy. But I do want to try that serial adapter. So the channel bank I have, you can figure it over serial. So I'm going to try to hook that up as well. And then, yeah, turn it on, try to get a feel for it, see what we can actually configure. But yeah, this ultimately, it's going to be hooked up to those machines. I'm going to throw this in my little networking closet and hopefully just have it sort of sitting and humming back there for whenever I need to connect to any of those machines and I can finally get them off my desk, clear up a ton of space, put it all in the rack, good to go, don't have to look at it. So yeah, let's, uh, let's get everything hooked up. So this is what the KVM looks like when it's all booted up. The boot up process actually takes a couple minutes and at some point you'll see a screen that has the Vertiv logo and it bounces around a little bit, sort of like an old DVD player in standby. But eventually when it actually boots up, you get to this target list full screen where it shows all of the modules that are plugged in. Now, I already did a factory reset of this unit right before I started recording, but you'll see I still have some names in here configured for the modules. The interesting thing is that the modules actually keep the name retained within them themselves. So if you move a module to a different machine, it'll keep the same name in there, despite having been sort of unpaired from whatever unit that it was in before. But before we actually go into any of these machines and check out the functionality, let's go through some of the options in here. So one useful page here is the overview. You'll see that I'm getting a power supply failure warning. That's simply because I just have power connected to power supply B. Unfortunately, it seems like there's no way to dis disable these errors. So it'll always be showing me power supply failure, even though I'm running this pretty much as I'm always going to run it. I mentioned before I did a factory reset, so that can be done with this option here. Won't go into doing that again. But I do want to point out that there's also this upgrade firmware option. So at the time that I got this for this unit last year, almost exactly a year ago, it was running the original Avocent firmware. So I was able to go to the Vertiv website, download the latest firmware, stick it on a USB drive, plug it in, and then upgrade it through there. You can also use TFTP, FTP, or HTTP, but it's much easier, I would say, to just go right with the USB stick. If you ever want to check to see which version of firmware your Avacent is running, you can go to this version screen right here. 
So I'm using the 2.12.3 and then the subversion 25987. One thing you're definitely going to want to do is make sure that you enable either IPv4 or IPv6 depending on your network. So by default, none of these are enabled. So I'd simply checked enable IPv4, enable DHCP, saved, and then it was able to give me an address on one of my networks here. If we further walk down the list here, something cool I saw over here in auditing. So these KVMs generate a ton of different events. So the UI lags a little bit here. If we go down to the bottom, yeah, so we could see user logged in, user logged out, target session started, stopped, terminated. Now, if you couple these events with destinations here, so for example, syslog destinations, you could have remote logging set up so that you can have really good auditing for anybody who's accessing this, which is great if you're trying to make it available to other people and give them access to different machines. If we further go down here for ports, go into IQ adapters here. So this will show all of the currently connected adapters. By default, out of the box, you'll see that the name matches the EID, so that unique identifier. What's really cool about this specific page is that you can also go ahead and upgrade the firmware on the modules themselves. Some of the modules have other options like using USB 1.1, USB 2, but generally everything seems to work pretty much right out of the box. So all of these units, I fully upgraded them to the latest firmware, and I don't have any issues with them at all, but it's just good to know that the uh, different firmware here for the modules is actually bundled into the Avocent firmware for the MPU itself. So no need to deal with other firmwares. If we keep going down this ports menu tree, so we have cascade switches, which I'm pretty sure is if you're sort of chaining these KVMs together. There's power devices. Uh, so this was not what I had hoped for when looking into if we would have anything to control different types of PDUs. I believe that this is something that's Vertiv or Avocent specific for their PDUs and you can sort of link them with a login credentials here. But I'm not sure if there's actually anything I can do since I don't have one of their PDUs. So local port UI. Something important to know is the invoke local port UI keyboard combination. So right now we have print screen and control control selected. I'll be making use of control control. So whenever we're actually remoted into a target machine, if I tap control control, then that brings me back out to the KVU or KVM menu. And then I'll be able to go back through all the options here. I won't be stuck in a specific session. You can also do port security. You can check scan time for online devices. Um, that's, that's the modules. And keyboard language, yeah. So the modem settings, I don't fully understand here. I mean, I, I guess we just plug in a modem and it sort of works magically, but I would have thought that there's a lot more config in here. But again, that's something for another time. Something with equally as little configuration is the setup port on the back. So it looks like you can enable just a basic password to get into that setup port. Not super useful, probably won't touch that, but I guess it's there and it gives a little bit more functionality. So now we go into sessions. So here we can do activity timeouts, login timeouts, this will essentially dump you back out into the KVM menu if you're in a session and you're idle for too long. Uh, there's also this concept of sharing, which I'm pretty sure means that you can have multiple people in the same session. Uh, what's cool is that that includes stealth sharing. 
So you can have somebody monitoring and it won't even appear that they're monitoring, or maybe it means just that they won't have any keyboard mouse input. They can just watch and not interact at all. It's KVM options. You can enable encryption for the keyboard and mouse. Uh, hardware presented to the target machine. So we want the machines to think we have an English keyboard, 1024 by 768 monitor, uh, viewer, let's change this. We're gonna want the HTML5 viewer in case anybody's going to be logging into this remotely. So this was one of the, the reasons that I bought this unit and upgraded all the way to the latest Vertif firmware is I want that HTMI viewing option. Virtual media, again, as uh, I mentioned previously, these devices, I guess the USB devices here that are plugged in, they have access to virtual media. So you can even choose which devices get and don't get access to it. You can have read only or read write. So that's great if you're trying to load a bunch of files off of uh, USB media that's plugged into the MPU and only want it read from your target devices so nobody accidentally goes in and modifies anything. Serial, we can enable Telnet access, which is pretty cool. I, I enjoy having Telnet available on things on my network, but I'm not gonna use that right now, so I'll leave that as is. And while I'm not gonna set anything up in user accounts right now, uh, I think it's really interesting the level of granularity you can get over the accounts. So let's say I wanted to add an account for somebody. I can give them a username, a password. Not sure what preemption level does. Maybe that's sort of like an override thing for connecting to sessions. Um, and then access level, you could have standard user, a user administrator, an appliance administrator. So I would probably give somebody access and let's say I only want them to have access to the Windows 98 machine. I could give them access to just that machine. And of course, save that but we're not gonna do anything with users right now. That's all something for me to figure out later, depending on who I wanna give access to what. But now we can actually go back to the list of machines here and we can give everything a try. So just something to note before I actually go in and check out each machine. So this Avacyn, as I had shown before, has VGA output. So it appears that this is 1024 by 768. Um, and I'm running that through an OSSC, open source scan converter that I had already owned uh, to convert it to HDMI and then split that out for this local display as well as a cheap HDMI capture device that I got. Uh, so that, that's what's recording the video for you. But because it is a should I say, interesting and cheap capture device. When the video is changing between these devices, you're probably gonna see some black dropouts, some color bars. And on top of that, I think one of the quirks for converting 1024 by 768 to 1080p through this OSSC is that we're gonna get a little bit of the edges of the screen cut off at sides, top and bottom. So it's gonna look a little cut off and you might get some wonkiness in video. I think there's color bars that are gonna come up from that HDMI dongle. But it's important to note that I'm really not going to be using this locally through a, a, just a direct KVM with a monitor here. I'm gonna do almost everything through the browser, through this thing's browser interface. So. Even though it's a little cut off, it's still usable, but at the end of the day, it's not a big deal breaker for me. Um, especially with this setup, I could probably fine tune the OSSC a bit more, but just for demo purposes, it's totally fine. So let's go into the Windows 98 here. You can see we can rename it if we want to. I'm not gonna bother right now. We'll go into KVM session. You can see we're in the Windows 98 machine here modem information. So this is just ExpressNet, which is already loaded, which I've shown before. Um, pretty straightforward. We get the video. It looks like it works fine. If I do control control, I get back. 
I'll disconnect that active session. You can keep sessions going. I don't see a real need for that though. I'll do cable sell it. So this is actually the machine running asterisk, which ultimately takes incoming calls and then provides um, telephony to the modem that is connected to that Windows 98 machine. So this is just Debian CLI. So nothing, nothing too crazy. I won't bother logging in. This is pretty much as good as it gets here for Debian on the command line. So we can just jump back out of that. Disconnect the active session. And then lastly, we'll go into this serial device. So this is actually connected to the Addit 600 channel bank. This technically sits between the modem connected to the Windows 98 machine and the cable salad Debian box. So the Debian box provides a T1 out to this channel bank, which then allows uh, copper-like FXS lines out to uh, hook up to. I think this thing can do, is it 24, 48 different subscribers? So pretty capable little device, but it's all configurable through RS-232. So using this serial module, you can get in here. So previous session timed out, it can hit enter a couple times. I can show A1, works perfectly. There's different uh, config options here. So if I go into control F8, I have a little bit of control here over the different settings to facilitate that serial connection. Uh, one thing I do want to note is that when I recorded setting this up earlier, uh, I showed just a little yellow gender changer for the DE9 port because both the uh, Addit and the serial module they had female connectors. So I needed a gender changer so that I could connect them together. Though what I should have done was use a null modem gender changer. So after I set that up initially, I realized I couldn't get connection and I had to swap that out. Uh, but that was just a little thing that hindered me for about a second before I realized my mistake. So when I get this machine actually installed, or I should say when I get all of these machines and the KVM actually installed, in the rack, I won't have this serial module directly hooked up to the Addit. I have an eight port console server, which I'm gonna hook that up to. So this is perfect for uh, the Addit, any Cisco devices that need out of band management, maybe some of my Livingston gear or my USR gear, anything that speaks RS-232, I can plug into that. And that sort of acts as a multiplexer for serial connections. So, this is definitely something that could be useful. Will I actually use this a lot? Because it's, it's sort of like a generated GUI for command line. So that makes logging hard. That makes a probably pasting hard. I'm not entirely sure how that's, that works very well or even highlighting. Um, so it's probably not super useful, but at a glance, something just to check configuration, maybe just run a couple of commands. Seems pretty easy, uh, pretty useful in that sense, but maybe not something that I'm necessarily going to drop down into if I don't have to. So, can back out to the menu here. Disconnect the session. So we're all disconnected. This basically covers the features of using this KVM locally, as though you're sitting in front of a keyboard, mouse, and monitor. But I'm going to showcase next the use that I actually bought this for, which was to do it via a browser on another machine. So on another machine that's in my network, I plugged in the IP address of the KVM and tried to load it up here. So the first thing when I try to load this up is that I'm prompted to create a password for the admin account. So that seems reasonable enough. So I'm just gonna use admin, admin, English. Okay, log in. And 
And as you can see, we get a very, very similar view that we did when we were trying to access locally. So just to sort of confirm that things are working, I'm not going to bother walking through everything else again. Uh, we can come into the device here, so Windows 98, and you can see that I have the option to do a Java session or HTML5 session. So I want HTML5. Make sure you disable pop-up blocker here. All right, let's try that one more time now that we don't have pop-up blocker here. Here we go. Perfect, okay. So if I hit escape, I can navigate all through the menus. There's a little bit of lag in refreshing. I'm wondering if I can go down here. Let's see, virtual keyboard. So it looks like we could do an on-screen keyboard if we wanted to, that's pretty useful. Nice little overlay. We can paste text from a file, screenshot mode. That'd be great for trying to get some images off of these machines that I connect to. Align cursor. So I think your cursor can go out of alignment at some point. So you can sort of refresh that positioning. Make this full screen. Don't need to do that. Auto just video. Then we just have generic settings in here. Okay, aspect ratio for scaling. Uh, we can change the performance. So if we're on a sort of laggy connection or maybe something slower, we can change that up. Windows macros, text pasting, pretty much everything you would really expect to see from some sort of uh, remote access software here. There's even a little sub menu for virtual media, macros. Uh, yeah, shows who's connected, what the address is. Pretty, pretty easy. So this would definitely help a lot if I need somebody else to be able to access one of these machines. They could just hop on right on in. That said, I don't think that I would make this KVM directly accessible over the internet. Even though it has that user password login screen, who knows when these things are going to continue to get updated, if ever. Who knows if there's any exploits in these. So I'll definitely put a layer of protection in front of it. But that's a different discussion altogether. For now, this completely does what I want to do by giving me access to a ton of different computers through PS2, USB, or even Serial, or even Sun when I get those adapters makes everything really easy to configure, makes this available in a browser, HTML5 over the network. Totally fits my use case here. So very happy with this solution. Really cool to poke around at this again. And next thing is for me to just get this all installed up and finally put this project of getting these machines regularly usable and available to bed. So hope you enjoyed all of that. I'll keep you up to date with any new advancements that come up from this Avacent KVM.